right, good morning, 1015. How are we feeling this morning? Man, y'all are fired up and ready. I also want to welcome everyone watching online with us right now. I want to let you know we have a very special guest with us today. You may hear him. We have a little bird that's hanging out in the HVAC duct today. Listen, if you hear him, could be the bird, could be the Holy Spirit. I don't know. I'm not here to tell you. Those of you watching at home, you don't have to worry. But if you hear it, probably the Holy Spirit. So... If you want to go ahead and pull out your notes inside your worship guide, follow along with us today as we are in week two of our series, Slay, and we are one weekend to 21 days of prayer and fasting. Yeah! Some people have had spiritual awakenings. Most of you are like, one week down, two weeks to go. I can't wait to be done with this. But listen, if you haven't participated in 21 days of prayer and fasting with us, it's not too late. You can pick up with us right now because it's just an opportunity for us to take things out of our lives that may distract us from time with the Lord and just be intentional about uh, creating that relationship and developing that relationship. And then at the end of the month, the last Sunday, the 29th, there'll be a night of prayer and worship here to conclude our 21 days of prayer and fasting. Go ahead and clear your calendar for that night because those nights are just absolutely incredible. So this, he, this se- uh, series, Slay, to slay is just to me to do it big. That it's going to be awesome. It's going to be successful. Like, I'm going to go kill this right here. And we'll say it like, you know, I'm going to go slay the day. I'm going to go slay this meeting. I'm going to slay this workout. Or a lot of times I'm going to slay this large pizza right here in front of me. But we want to talk about slaying things this month to start the year off on that right foot. And the theme verse we're using is out of Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. It says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And that's the idea that all month long we're going to lean on his power. Not ours, because we can only do so much. But whenever it comes to Jesus and his power, he can do so much more than what we can do by ourselves. And last week, we talked about slaying financially. In week one, we're going to talk about finances. Why? Because it's so important to us. We stress about it. We think about it probably more than anything else. It's tangible. And we just talked about some principles that the Bible teaches us about our resources and how to manage those. Why? So we can have a great financial year in 2023. Today, we've titled the message, Slay Physically. We're going to talk about our health. We're going to talk about physical fitness today. We're going to talk about what the Bible talks about our bodies and our health. Because here's the thing. Every year, most people make New Year's resolutions. And in 2023, there was a survey done, and the top five New Year's resolutions for 2023 were number five, spend more time with friends and family. Number four, save more money. Number three, lose weight. Number two, eat healthier. Number one, exercise. Top three, all related around exercise and diet and our fitness and our health. And I have to believe that's not just 2023, but that's probably every single year we see people worried about their health and say, this year is going to be the year. Hasn't been that way for the last 20, but this year is going to be the year where I am going to get healthy. And we want to help us do that for several different reasons. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says this. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters... In view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. This is so important for us to understand, to offer our bodies as a sacrifice to God. Why? Because they're not ours. And when we can realize that our bodies don't necessarily belong to us, that we have to take care of them. God gave us our bodies. They were created in his image, so we want to take very good care of them. Of this gift. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 and 22 says, My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Don't let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Our health, our body. Because here's what we have to understand. We can understand this, this will all make sense. Our bodies, it's important for us to keep them in good physical condition because Jesus tells us it's not about the things here and now. It's not about likes on social media. It's not about the perfect posts. But he was called us. He said, go out. I'm giving you authority. Go out into the world and make disciples of all nations. How in the world can we do what Jesus has told us to do if we are not physically able? We have to take care of our bodies so we can do what he has called. Not just for 2023. But this is next year, 
the year after, 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years down the road to do what Jesus has called us to do. Because the world wants to tell us these resolutions are about our appearances. It's about looking good in a bathing suit. It's about looking good at the beach. Ladies, it's about being, being fit and looking good in that dress. But that's not what it's about. What we're going to learn is that the physical is so closely tied to the spiritual. And today we're going to walk through several things, what the, Bi- what the Bible tells us about our bodies and how we can actually slay physically in 2023. So let's pray, see what God wants to tell us today. God, we love you, and we're just thankful for these moments together. We never want to take those lightly, and God, we just pray that every single one of us, hearts, our eyes, our our ears, our mouths, everything is open, that we are just opening ourselves up to do, to receive your word, exactly what you want to tell us today. So this year, we can do something different. This year, we'll break the cycle. That This year, we'll be able to take care of ourselves physically in a way that we can do the work that you have called us to do, God. And we can't wait to see what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So number one, the first thing we have to understand, that our bodies, our role is to manage it. Number one is to manage it. We have to manage our bodies. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 says, Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? who lives in you and was given to you by God. You don't belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. You do not belong to yourself. This body is on loan. We're to honor it, which means we're to take care of it. We're to respect it. We're to hold it into high regard. And one thing we all know is that oftentimes whenever we get gifts and whenever we give gifts, typically, if, especially if you have kids, you understand that there's a lot of time, effort, money, energy into finding the perfect gifts for our children, for our grandchildren, and we agonize about it to make sure it's perfect. But we oftentimes know that whenever we give those gifts to our children or our grandchildren or whoever it is, that typically it is lost or broken in no time. Like a week tops, that gift is no good anymore. It's gone. They don't care about it because the truth is that we don't have the same honor in giving that we do receiving. We really just don't care. It's like, oh, great, that's another gift. Oh, well, it's broke. I'll go move on to the next best thing. And when we can understand that our bodies are a gift from God, it begins to shift our focus just a little bit. It'll change the way we treat ourselves and we treat our bodies. We have to act like it's if something borrowed. Have you ever bar- uh, had to let someone borrow something and it gets broken? That stinks, right? We get kind of angry about that. You ever borrowed something and broken that person's, whatever it is, you just hope they forget about it. They don't, you don't want to replace it or pay for it. Listen, we need to treat our bodies not like we're borrowing a friend's car, even our parent's car. We need to treat our bodies like we are borrowing grandmama's car because you want to take care of grandmama. You don't want to make her upset. You don't want to make her angry. You will do everything possible to take care of grandma, right? So we need to treat our bodies in the exact same way because we don't own it. And when we can understand that we don't own our bodies, we'll be able to manage it a little bit better. The same thing as the financial principles we talked about last week. Our resources, our money that is given to us by God to manage and to steward. Our bodies are no different. Number one, we have to be able to manage it. Number two is we have to mold it. We manage it, we mold it. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27 says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. And you may be thinking, well, that's great because I'm not an athlete, so why do I really need to train like an athlete? No, we're not all athletes in here. We don't necessarily have to train at the level of an athlete, but we are called to something even bigger than athletes are called to. My wife, she got into the Ancestry.com and 23andMe and the DNA stuff about a year and a half or so ago. And it's really, really interesting. But something cool that 23andMe does is they will take your DNA and they will tell you different things that you may be prone to. What your DNA tells you about your body and this and that. She called me one day. She said, guess what? My DNA tells me that it is equivalent to that of an elite athlete. It's like, what? Like, your DNA can tell you that? I was like, well, you know, I guess that makes sense. See, she was a professional athlete for about 12 years or so, and that's another story for another day. She's going to kill me for saying that, but she has been an elite athlete, so that makes sense. So, of course, I've got to find out. So I get the 23 of me, I do the swabs, I send it all in, I could care less about the ancestry, this or that, I got the results, I logged in, only time I've ever logged in, and I too am an elite athlete. <laughs> Which means, my dream, because I firmly believe if I had six months to train the way I should, 
I could be on the U.S. men's curling team. <laughs> Lifelong dream. I, I can't show, sh, 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 y'all can see it? So if you know anyone in curling, please find me after church. It's a lifelong dream. But here's the thing about training like an athlete. There was a study done not too long ago that found that athletes spend their spare time, 38% of their free time, they spend training and exercising and taking care of their bodies. That's not at practice. That's not their training they require. This is extra time spent to perfect their craft. They were the highest of any profession. Musicians were next at 18 or 19 percent. All the others were less than 2 percent. Here's another study that Reebok did a few years ago. They found the average American exercises less than 1 percent of their time here on earth. Less than 1 percent. Now compare that to the study also found that the average American spends 41 percent of their time here on earth in front of some sort of technology, whether it be a computer, a cell phone, a TV, a laptop, it doesn't matter. So we're training ourselves more for technology than exercising our bodies and taking care of our bodies in the way that God has called us to do. Because we are looking for an easy way out. We are. Look at culture. Look at everything that is currently automated around us. We have microwaves that'll cook our food in two and a half minutes when it's frozen. We have machines to wash our clothes. We have cars that will drive ourselves. You can just sit back, relax, it will drive on its own. But here's one thing about our bodies and our fitness is we can't and we won't rely on anyone else. No one or nothing can get your body the way that it was designed to be. We're all looking for that special pill. Or man, if I could just have that type of surgery. We're all looking for the easy way out where we don't really have to necessarily work at it. And you'll see all these ads, all these commercials that will say, you know, with this pill, you too can become shredded and lose 30 pounds in 30 days. And there are hundreds of these pills out there, but every single one of them say, this pill coupled with diet and exercise, you too can be shredded like Jimmy and have an eight pack. Okay? With diet and exercise. Not the easy way out. And there are times where we need medicine or we need a surgery, but if we don't do anything with it, we're going to be right back where we were before. It takes time. It takes work. It takes discipline. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 even says this. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. It's painful to work out. Listen, I wake up few times a week at 4 a.m. to go to the gym. The guys I go with, no. I hate it. It's awful. I hate everything about it, but that's really the only time that I can necessarily go because if I didn't, I wouldn't be able to eat pizza the way that I like to eat pizza. But I absolutely hate it. But it's hard. Anything worth doing isn't supposed to be easy. We're required to mold our bodies. We manage what God has gave us. We mold it into the way that he has designed for us. And number three is we're to model it. We're to model our bodies. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 says, Then each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. We're to model it every single day. Whenever you walk with Jesus and you follow Jesus, people should be able to look at us and say, Man, there's something different about that person. Man, they're just, they're just not quite like everything else. Same thing with our bodies. They should be able to tell that, man, there's just something different about that person. Why? Because we're not doing it for likes on Instagram. We're doing it for something bigger. We're doing it to go make disciples because that's what Jesus has called us to do. Listen, you can only have so much plastic surgery before it looks fake and it's not going to last. You've seen it. It's not going to last. It's a cheap alternative. It's fake to the real thing. It's Instagram versus reality. When I was preparing for this yesterday and going through this point, I said, you know what? I could set my laptop up, laptop up all nice. I can open my Bible, have the perfect scripture underlined, put the pins down. I can put my glasses down, have a nice scratch pad with all perfect writing on it, cup of coffee, steam and sunlight coming. I could make a beautiful post that would be awesome and, you know, can't wait for the Lord to speak to me in my preparation or something like that. But if you scale back, you would see my laptop has like 100 tabs open on it. I've got multiple Bibles open. I don't have coffee. I've got water spilt over on my desk. I'm looking for my glasses. They're actually on top of my head. I can't write at all. It's chicken scratch. My pad looks terrible. And the truth is there's wads of paper all over the place. It's messy. 
It's not Instagram. It's supposed to be messy. When you see these fitness models and these people posting stories on Instagram about how great you know, everything is at the gym and their outfits are perfect, their hair is perfect, their makeup's perfect, it's a lie. If we were to get up and take a field trip next door, you'd see that doesn't exist. Man, they're sweating. If they're breathing hard. It's not that pretty. When they go run on the treadmill, you'll see, it's not like that at all. Running on the treadmill is hard. It's miserable. The guys I work out with will tell you, I hate running on the treadmill. And if you hate running on the treadmill, Proverbs tell us that only the wicked run when no one is chasing you. So you're free to not run. Just say, I'm trying to live the way the Bible has told me to. I ain't running. But when I run on the treadmill, I'm, I'm not that. I look like Phoebe. My arms are flailing all over the place. I'm breathing heavy. My legs hurt. My knees hurt. My back hurts. I'm about to have a heart attack. It's miserable. We see people making food in their kitchens, the meal prep, and everything is perfect in the pan, and everything is perfectly placed in Tupperware bowls, and the kitchen is pristine, and it's big, and it's beautiful. It's not like that. You ever cooked before? Come on. There's spills all over the oven. You got the, the fire alarm going off. There's dishes in the sink. There's water going. You got spills all over the place. It's messy because it's not supposed to be a picture-perfect post all the time. Because whenever we run through things in our lives, it is only Jesus who turns our mess into a masterpiece. That's it. Yeah. Ephesians even tells us our bodies are like a masterpiece. Because we're living something out for him more than likes on Instagram. We're not doing it for physical fitness. So how are we modeling our bodies every single day? What does that look like? Are we doing it for the likes? Or maybe are we doing it for what we've been called to do instead? And if you're not sure where to go, I am so glad you asked. If you turn your notes over on the back, we're going to talk through three things, a routine for us to be able to slay physically this year. Number one on the back, our routine, the first one is cleansing. We have to be cleansing. Cleansing is just the, po the process of making something thoroughly clean, like Danny Tanner style clean. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 says, Because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit, and let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. We have to cleanse ourselves, get rid of all the junk, all the stuff that can defile our bodies. And it's not an easy, pretty process. It's a reason New Year's resolutions are the same towards fitness every single year. It's not easy. We just talked about it. it takes discipline. It's hard, difficult work. A study shows that 39% of Americans make New Year's resolutions. However, just 9% of those people feel like they even somewhat accomplished those resolutions at the end of the year. Most of us know by February 1st, it's gone. We've even seen January 2nd, New Year's resolutions out the window. I'll try again next year. I don't work. That's why we're not so hung up on New Year's resolutions. 21 days of prayer and fasting, we do it at the beginning of a year because they're, for a reason. Because there is something about turning the calendar to a brand new year saying, I'm going to take a step. This year is going to be different. I'm going to break a cycle this year. There's just something about it. The reason it's 21 days, hmm, it takes three weeks to form a habit. The idea of 21 days of prayer and fasting is not for us to go to Facebook and say, peace out, 21 days of prayer and fasting, see you in three weeks. It's not just to cut out a couple of foods so we can lose a few pounds for three weeks. It's not about that. It's to cleanse. It's to take the things out of our lives that don't necessarily need to be there. So we can do something bigger, so we can do what we are called to do. So maybe during that time, we form some habits to say, you know what? I feel pretty good. You know, this, is, this has been kind of great. I've really deepened my relationship with Jesus. You know, I, I don't need... Facebook so much anymore. I don't necessarily need this so much anymore. So it is a habit that has been formed, not just for 21 days, for the remainder of the year and next year and 5, 10, 15 years to the rest of your life. That's what 21 days of prayer and fasting is. That's what cleansing is all about. It's not throwing stuff in a closet when people come over. It is thoroughly cleansing. We need to be able to have filters in our lives, and whenever we bought our house a few years ago, we have a water filtration system throughout the entire house. So anything comes in, goes through this filtration system, and all the bad things are taken out of it. Anyone who lives in this area knows we do not have the best water. 
And we got the filtration system, and our faucets, they never, never have anything on them that's perfectly clean. The truth is my toilet water is just as clean as this at home because it filters out all the bad. We need filters. We need filters in our lives. We need filters for our eyes, for our ears, what we listen to, what we watch, for our minds, for our mouths. We need filters for our hearts. We need filters to be able to filter out all the bad things in our lives. Why? So we can be fully cleansed. Because there's this terrible misconception that for us to step into a church or for us to follow Jesus and have that relationship with him, that we got to clean ourselves up first. The man, I got to quit drinking. Got to stop gambling. Got to stop looking at that. Got to stop that relationship. I need to end this. I need to stop this over here. I got to reconcile this. I have to do all this. Once I clean myself up perfectly and I am pure and I am holy and I am righteous, then I can step towards Jesus. That's not it at all. I heard a great way this was explained a few weeks ago. They were talking about thinking we have to clean up before we go to Jesus. So let me ask you something. When you take a shower, do you clean yourself up before? I was like, well, no, that's, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You, you take a shower to get clean. He said, exactly. He said, you don't have to clean yourself up to go to Jesus. When you go to Jesus, he is the one who will help you clean yourself up. You don't have to clean yourself up. Now, yes, you need to stop doing those things because you are to be presented holy and without fault, but it's all because of the love and the grace and mercy of Jesus that he will clean us up. He will lead us along that way. Y'all, we need Jesus for this full Cleansing, that's the first part of our routine, is a cleansing. Number two, it's caring. We cleanse and then we care. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 29 says, No one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. That's so true. If you hate something, you're not going to take care of it. You're not going to worry with it. You're not going to spend your time on it. So we want to ask ourselves, what do we care about? What do we care about? What are we spending our time and focus and energy on? What are we trying to improve in our lives? For some of it, it it is our health. And that's great. It's our finances. It's our marriages. It's our relationships, our friendships, our careers. All that is great. But for some of us, it's TV, social media, it's our sports, it's our status, it's politics, it's shopping, it's movies. It's all of this other stuff that we focus all of our time and all of our energy on rather than ourselves. Jesus didn't say, go watch every series on Netflix. He said, go out and make disciples. So what are we doing to take care of ourselves? My uncle, Jim Jim Bill is what we call him. His name is Jim Snipes. Lives out in California. He's 89 years old. And he had a stroke a few years ago, but he's still really, really sharp in his brain. But man, this guy did everything. He took care of himself so well. He was a professor at UCLA. He was a physicist. He made something that went on the International Space Station. He's just such an interesting guy. He woke up every morning and would stretch for 30 minutes. He never had a meal without a salad. And I'm not talking about a salad in a bag. But he would go pick something from his yard and make a salad out of it. He wouldn't eat Velveeta cheese. He called it plastic cheese. That garbage is no good for you. He played water polo with a bunch of college kids until he was 80 years old. He used to surf at least two, three days a week until he was 85 years old. Why was he able to do that? Because he took care of himself and he valued his body. Now, if we do the same thing, we can do all those cool things too. But you know what else that means? Man, we can just take more people with us to Jesus. If we just care for ourselves. And you may be thinking, well, it's too late for me. I'm too old. I'm too far gone. I've fallen too many times. Let me let you feel better about yourselves for just a second because we've been given this precious gift to take care of. You're thinking, I haven't taken care of this gift very well. Reference Luke chapter 2. And towards the end of Luke chapter 2, you'll see what I'm talking about. See, Mary and Joseph, you know Mary and Joseph, Jesus' earthly parents. Mary and Joseph, when Jesus was 12 years old, get this, they lost Jesus. They lost him. Didn't know where he was. They were traveling back from Jerusalem And, you know, Mary and Joseph are just sitting up talking about things like, you know what, it's going to be kind of quiet back there. They look and see, Jesus is gone. They left him in Jerusalem. And you can imagine that argument that they were having. Well, if you'd pay attention to your surroundings, maybe this wouldn't be a problem. Well, if you had stopped watching TikTok all day, maybe you would have noticed that he wasn't here. So they go back to Jerusalem and look for him. They don't find him for three more days. They lost Jesus, the Messiah. The most precious gift the world will ever see for four days. 
for four days. Can you imagine what that prayer looked like? When they were praying, God, um, we love you. Um, listen, you know that Jesus, that the, the son, yeah, you, we lost him. So I'm sorry, but I, I don't know if you have another miracle boy up there. We'll put one of those back passions with a leash on them next time. I'll we'll make sure this doesn't happen again. The most precious gift the world has ever seen, and they lost them for four days, yet they were still trusted with the life of Jesus. Even though we haven't done it thus far, or maybe we've fallen, or we think we're too far gone to go ahead and start now, it's never too late. It's just not. We can do it. He trusts us. Because if he didn't, Jesus would have never gone to the cross. He trusts us to care for ourselves. And number three, it's controlling. Our routine needs to be controlling. We need to have self-control. If we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, it says, You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. Again, you say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Listen, we're free to make any decision that we want to make. We're free to do whatever it is we want to do, but we know some of the decisions we make are not the best for us. We know that it may not necessarily be good for us because oftentimes whenever we feel that urge and we fall into that temptation, it's because we're trying to fill this giant void, this giant hole in our lives. And we hate this idea like we are losing control of what's going on. And whenever we lose control, we begin to have these major fear, fears and depression and anxiety in our lives. And it all, all is because there's this void missing in our lives and we're trying to fill it. One thing that I've learned is where we have the most fear is where we trust God the least. We just don't trust them in that area. We think we have to have full control of it. We have to have self-control over our bodies, over ourselves. This summer, we did a series called Bear Fruit. This is one of the fruits of the Spirit, is self-control. And it just puts up guard well at rails. It creates those filters. It's controlling ourselves, controlling our emotions, controlling those urges. And there are times where you think, well, I can't do it. But Jesus does. Jesus knows you can do it. By now, I'm sure everyone knows the name Damar Hamlin. If you don't know who Damar Hamlin is, a quick summary of who Damar Hamlin is. He's a 24-year-old safety for the Buffalo Bills. Starting safety on one of the best teams, on one of the best defenses in the NFL. And on Monday Night Football, with 23.9 million people watching live, in the first quarter, Damar Hamlin makes a tackle near midfield, Pretty harmless tackle. We've seen way worse. He gets up from the tackle, kind of takes a step, and you see his legs just go out from under him. He collapses on the field. And in a stadium of Cincinnati with 60 or 70,000 fans screaming at the top of their lungs becomes silent. You see people begin to pray. There is concern. You see players and coaches gathered together, hugging, crying on their knees. They are praying. You see medical professionals onto the field to work on DeMar Hamlin. He suffered cardiac arrest on the field. And for nine minutes, medical personnel had to work on DeMar Hamlin. They gave him CPR. They used a defibrillator. He was dead on the field for nine minutes, and they were able to bring him back to life. They rushed him to a nearby hospital where he spent four days in the ICU. Unbelievable. And all you see in the media, social media, everywhere you look, praying for Damar Hamlin. Let's pray to God for Damar Hamlin. God, we're praying to you for the health and the safety of Damar Hamlin. We're praying for peace for his family. You see other teams in their games gathering together, fans gathering together on their knees, praying for Damar Hamlin. You see outside the hospital, people lined up with candles, praying for Damar Hamlin. He was on the field dead for nine minutes and only spent nine days in the hospital where he is now home in Buffalo and expected to make a full recovery. Everything is intact. His brain is intact. And all over, all you could see was pray for DeMar Hamlin. Even the largest sports media company in the world, ESPN, had an analyst live on television pray to God for DeMar Hamlin. That doesn't happen. Hundreds of millions of people have seen this, if not billions, have seen the NFL world and fans Pray to God for Damar Hamlin. And I say all this to say this. That we look at this and there are people like, why is it such a big deal? People die of cardiac arrest every day. Yeah, they most certainly do. And it's sad. And it's tragic. But the reason this is so important is because we need to understand God doesn't cause all things, but God will use all things. Because if we've had nearly a billion people here, nothing but let's pray for Damar 
Hamlin. A 24-year-old starting safety for one of the best teams in the NFL. Probably one of the most physically fit people in the world. A professional at his craft. One of the greatest players in the world at what he does. What does this show us? That even the most physically fit people in the world still need Jesus. He will use this. When the world is watching and showing, pray to God for Damar Hamlin. God will show up and he will use it. If one of the greatest athletes in the world who is in peak physical condition still needs God to be able to survive physically, we still need God in every aspect of our lives. Whether it's physically, it's mentally, it's emotionally, spiritually, relationally, our families, our friends, or whatever it looks like. Y'all, we need Jesus. Without him, we're not going to be able to make it. Listen, I want to pray for you. If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes, our worship team's going to come back up. And if you're our guest today, they're going to play music lightly in the background. And when we think about Damar Hamlin, and we see what God has done with that, an elite athlete dead on a field in front of millions and millions of people watching live on television where the one constant message was pray for Damar Hamlin. And you see God do what only God does. Can you imagine what God can do for us? Whatever that may look like for us, it all starts with a relationship with Jesus. Just opening ourselves up to be strong enough, to have enough control to say, Jesus, I can't do this on my own. I can't manage myself without you. I can't mold myself without you. I can't model myself without you. I can't cleanse myself without you. I can't care myself without you. I can't control myself without you. Jesus, please enter this area of my life. And if you're here today, you, you, you feel that. You've been doing it on your own for so long. You felt like you're on an island all by yourself. You feel like you can't pick yourself up. You feel like you've made too many mistakes. I'll never be cleansed. I can promise you, when Jesus enters in, it changes everything. And if that's you today, then you simply just want to drop it to Jesus and surrender it to Jesus and say, I want to do this with you because I can't do it myself. You would simply say this prayer to begin that relationship. You would say, God, today, I'm asking for forgiveness for all my sins. That I recognize I can't do it on my own. That today I need Jesus. And I recognize you sent him to die on a cross for me. And it was only the power of you that was able to resurrect him three days later. And today, I recognize him as my Lord and my Savior. And I want to make Jesus number one in my life. And God, for every single one of us, I just pray that we'll take inventory of where we currently stand in every aspect of our lives. But asking you today, God, physically, what can we do? God, just to show the areas of our lives where we can improve so we can go and do what we've been called to do which is bring people your love. Bring people your care, your provision. And God, whatever steps it takes, I pray that you'll just give us the strength and the courage to be able to take that step. Even if we don't see where we're going, to have the faith in you that you're gonna come through and be there every step of the way, God. I pray that you'll just transform our minds and our hearts to align with what you have for us, God. And we'll give you all the credit when you do it. We love you in Jesus' name. Can we give him all the praise we've got this morning? Come on.